Good afternoon, everyone. So nice to see you all. I'm Lara Downs, and we're so happy that you're joining us for this panel on forwarding diversity via podcasts and radio on the airwaves in the digital space. Um, you know, all of us in the arts are always examining the question of audience, who it is, where it is, how we're engaging and communicating. And I think that this year, this time that has imposed isolation and shutdown and has demanded so much creativity and reaching out to connect with that audience, it's really been a time of growth. We're reimagining and redefining our audiences and we are finding them everywhere and anywhere. And I think that we have seen, especially during this time, the power of radio and broadcast media to serve as a connecting force a source of comfort and inspiration and an agent of change. And I'm so pleased to welcome this panel of guests who represent so many facets of this work. We have Terrence McKnight with us, beloved evening host at WQXR, brilliant writer and producer and a thinker outside of boxes. Garrett McQueen is the executive producer of the Triloquy podcast and is an activist who's really leading the charge for a new level of engagement in the area of diversity and inclusion. James Bennett, digital editor at WQXR with a fresh take that I really appreciate on the possibilities of communicating in the digital space. And Gretchen Nielsen is the executive producer of From the Top and is actively reimagining the profile and presence of a very important platform for the next generation. We have a lot to talk about today and I hope that everyone who's watching will submit your questions. We really want this to be an interactive session and we will be happy to take questions at the end. So I would love to just go, go around and ask all of the panelists to quickly sort of summarize how you got here. What attracted you to radio broadcast media in the first place and, and why? Um, let's start with Terrence. I was a student and I was really trying to supplement my knowledge of music when I was at Morehouse. And there was an NPR show called Performance Today. And Performance Today really brought um, present the stuff that we were talking about in history books. So the composers that we talked about, the music we talked about from a historical perspective, Performance Today talked about that music like, oh, it just happened in Atlanta last night. Oh, it's gonna happen in Connecticut tomorrow. And this is who's conducting it. This is who's playing it. So Performance Today was my way in uh, supplementing my education. Garrett, how about you? Absolutely. And before I start, I just want to make sure that I honor uh, the ancestral lands of the Sioux from where I'm calling today, specifically the Wapakute of the Eastern Dakota. I honor their uh, ancestral rights to this land. Uh, also, before I want to start, I want to quickly invite everyone black to go to isblackmusicians.org, join the mailing list where we'll be having a, a special extension of this conversation specific for black content creators and folks looking to uh, collaborate with us. So as far as what first attracted me to radio and uh, broadcast media, I saw a problem that I could couldn't actually fix as a bassoonist. There was an, an inaccurate and incomplete aural aesthetic of so-called classical music being codified by public radio stations. I wasn't hearing new music. I wasn't hearing black music, and I wasn't hearing music that spoke to the classical traditions of non-Western European experiences. So I put down the bassoon and forfeited my tenured orchestra position to focus on this work by way of radio and now by way of podcasting and other content creation. And James. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, it was a specific attraction to public media insofar as it was a place or could be a place of discovery of the life of the mind and of, you know, trying to, you know, further the idea uh, of that life. And, you know, when I started, I was doing a lot of what you could just kind of call, you know, maybe like retail content, like kind of almost like content milly things. And, um, you know, over the years, I just began to think, there might be a better way to engage with an audience um, in a more deeper and meaningful, you know, way, basically. Um, and so you can kind of just trace this, like, you know, journey of going from a startup ghostwriter to someone doing, you know, digital work, you know, for a major station into, you know, some very fulfilling, at least for me, um, explainer and investigative, like, you know, journalism. So that's my that's my bag. And Gretchen. Well, I grew up in Amish country in Pennsylvania, 
and spent a lot of time in cars getting places. So the radio was for me um, a companion and it was also a portal to other worlds. Um, when I was growing up, there were many more fixed or mixed format stations. So um, classical music, jazz, world music, poetry, storytelling, that was, that was the backdrop of so much of my life growing up. And so I feel really, really lucky to um, be helping to lead an organization that is, is really reflective of my childhood. Mm. We all, I think, are, you know, we're drawn to this medium, obviously, for different reasons. And I think that we, we have a sense of the power that we hold um, when we are on the air, when we're creating content, when we're speaking outwards, you know, to, to our communities. If you could each summarize in your own positions, in your own work, how, how do you define your power to impact your community through your work? Whoever wants to jump in first. So we just go, let's take the same order. Terrence, you start. Oh, okay. How do I define my power, my work? Um, you know, Lara, I don't think about that so much. Uh, but if I had to um, try and put it in a sentence or two, um, I just have to think about the power that, that music has and what attracted me to music. Um, the work I do on air is about music, and it just takes me back to, to, you know, being involved as a church musician. And even before being a church musician, just seeing the power of music, particularly in my grandfather's church in Mississippi, how music tended to be, or it seemed like it was life or death. And singing, those folks didn't sing out of a hymn book. They sang from their hearts. And it seemed like they needed that music to get through the week. Like that music was uh, a way of testifying. And I saw people doing all kinds of things, you know, uh, shouting and, and dancing and singing and the power of music just drew me in. And so as a young musician um, who started playing in church, the power to kind of galvanize people, spirit through a tune, through a, a, a hymn, um, I saw that it's very, uh, comforting to a lot of folks. You know, a lot of folks in my church were comforted by the music that um, that we were able to provide. And as I grew up and, and got better at it and, and learned more of a musical language, I saw that power increasing. And um, so for me, it's never been about myself, about me. It's been about the power of the language to bring people together and to try to uplift folk. And so, so as a musician, I bring that to radio, that same understanding that music can do that, music can create community. And so some of the documentaries that I've done on radio has been about that music in the life of somebody in order to kind of galvanize for a, a bigger cause to, to use music, uh, the power of music to reach out and uh, make things better for folks. So, if I have any power in my job, it's it's the power of music and using the power of music to, to just try to make things a little bit better. Well, I will share with, with you something that you may not know, which is that I also think that your presence, your voice on the radio and the way that you speak about music and the way that you storytell around music means so much to so many people who really rely on that as a, as a connection and as, um, yeah, just sort of part of their daily lives. You know, I always tell this story. I have this friend who lives on 86th and West End and I often stay with her when I'm in town and she has QXR on her radio in her kitchen 24 hours a day. And so she's kind of like passing in and out of orbit, but it's there. And for me, that's sort of the magical thing, you know, about this presence that we provide on the air. So don't forget about that too. <laughs> um, Garrett. Talk about yes. your role in your community. I know it's very important to you. Well, uh, first, I've been asked to um, repeat the website for the International Society for Black Musicians. That's isblackmusicians.org, an organization founded by Katie Brown and Delaney Harris, uh, two incredible women who I consider colleagues uh, in the space of uh, podcasting and content creation. So to the question, I define my power 
uh, to impact community by my ability to speak freely or keep it trill, as the title of my podcast suggests. In the early days of Triloquy, black guests used to always ask me, can I say whatever I want? And for me, this was proof that there were very few spaces in which artists and arts advocates could bring their entire selves into the room. And I considered offering that sort of space to people very empowering, not only for them, but for me and my team as well. But I think it's also important to speak to measuring impact. I personally measure it in what my work and what my team's work has inspired. This includes new curriculums and grade schools and colleges across the country that cite Triloquy. I measure it by the a professional situation I've been able to maintain for myself thanks to institutions and the many individuals who financially support my team's work. But most importantly, I measure it in the art that I'm seeing grow. More and more people are really understanding how music can speak to today's challenges and today's solutions. And I'm immensely proud and always grateful for me and my team to be players in that corner of the arts. Yeah, James, and I think that that's something that you do as well in your writing. I've seen that, you know, you're always kind of trying to find the context and the relevance to today's life. And of course, this is, you know, the struggle for all of us. We, the music that we're sharing and, and storytelling around is, is by and large older music and we're trying to create the continuum. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you approach that in the digital space and the and the role that you see your, you know in yourself as a connector and a yeah absolutely I mean for me I, I've never used this term before now so I'm just kind of testing it out but in that digital space there seems to be this level of almost veto power and I like to use that and by that I mean specifically I've told people that writing about classical music can be if you choose a very easy thing to do, to look through the quote unquote standard rep, to use the same phrases, to use the same language to describe what you're hearing, to talk about the music that everyone else is talking about. And I think from where I am, I have this, I'm you know, very lucky to have this position where I can take on stories that I think matter to me and that I think matter to you know the black community, or at least people that might be, you know, not part of like, you know, this, again, quote unquote, great conversation, this classical, um, you know, conversation. Um, and I think to myself, right, if there is a new record that comes out of, you know, some Mozart rep, that's cool. And if you like it, that is, I mean, I, I listen to Mozart and I, and, I, and, I, and I love that, but I know that there are going to be legacy papers, legacy organizations that will be all over that. And I don't think that I'm really furthering any conversation necessarily by just kind of piling onto it. And so it, it's a measure of extra work to go and see who is recording, who is, you know, who is talking, who is listening to this music um, in these spaces that may not be getting, uh, not even that kind of like publicity love, but that's not been introduced to that conversation per se. Um, and so it, it, it's, it felt weird at first, but now it's a little bit, freeing to be able to pass on, um, you know, uh, the 18th recording of, let's say, like, Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, you know, for the year. Great <laughs> for the year. <laughs> yeah. it goes, that's keeps. the point. It's, it's a cycle that just kind of keeps <laughs> going, and it's so easy just to hop into it, and you can coast for a while, but you have to ask yourself at the end of the day, like, am I furthering any conversation by piling into, you know, I guess what's expected, like, and this is the last thing I'll say. It's like I feel that there is a conflation of classical criticism and journalism and you know classical like publicity work. And a lot of times there's like I think there's a perception that they're one and the same. And it's up to you know it's up to the creator in this case me to be able to separate that and be able to draw that line. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, and and Terrence has done so much work over the years as well to kind of bring new things to the forefront and dig deep into the stories that you know, are not so well known instead of continuing to tell the ones that are. One thing that hasn't come up, and I wanna hand this off to you, Gretchen, because I know you think about this a lot, is our, role, our roles in our communities as it pertains to representation. And I'll just say that for myself, in the things that I choose to record and the, the stories I choose to tell about them, and now in my, in my brand new work you know, on, on air and in the digital space, that to me is also very important, is for us just to show up and to be the voices that are heard and the faces that are seen. And I think that that has a tremendous impact in sort of redefining that audience and community in itself. And Gretchen, this is something that you and I have talked about. So will you speak a little bit to that in terms of the, from yeah. the top of the 
present and the future? Well, I, I will say like right now, when, when you put the question out to us, what is my power to impact my community right now? It's really about leading um, an effort to center racial equity at from the top. And it's, it's about us designing our future. Um, and it's kind of, I would say it's moving from a, a consciousness and intent to truly redesigning with equity in mind. And um, I recognize that from the top is we're an institution, we're a gatekeeper um, and we're in an ecosystem with other gatekeepers. So I think a lot right now, I feel like part of my power is examining that power and sharing that power and seeding that power um, and making sure that as an organization, you know, all organizations have um, finite resources. So what are the levers that we can pull to actually make a difference in, you know, who is on our program, who is telling stories, whose artistry we're, we're getting access to, um, but also who's, who's making the decisions behind the scenes um, it's, it's all interconnected and it's something that is, is just really, um, it's such a big part of my work right now. Yeah. You know, change is, um, a slow thing and not accomplished in giant steps usually. And I feel like we're, we're living right now in a moment when there's a lot of focus on change and sort of internal and external pressure towards change. And, you know, we're all just doing our thing every day. Um, but if I can ask you to think about the ways in which you have experienced or accomplished change, let's say over the last five years, or even in this past year, and what are the, what are the mechanisms you've used to do that? Who are the allies who've helped you do that? What are the challenges that you faced in doing that? I know it's a big question, but if you can just come up with some examples. Um, James, you wanna start? I see you. You know, I, yeah, I was thinking about this and the thing about, oof, I like my job and I want to keep it. <laughs> <laughs> the Ooh, thing I about the, the idea of change, it, sometimes it's frustrating, right? But nothing is as monumental, right? as sudden as you want it to be, or as you think it deserves to be. Um, the way that I, and, and this is what gets interesting, the way that I see myself, right, is as an agitator. And I, I hope to see myself as an agitator, um, as an instigator in some respects. Um, if we're talking personally, what, you know, what we've seen, what we've been able to accomplish in like, you know, the past five years, the past one year, I remember when I first began to, uh, you know, write for WQXR, um, you know, as a content creator, you know, or whatever that means in this kind of digital space, there seemed to be this institutional unwillingness across the board, you know, not, not just at that station, but across the board um, sometimes to, I would say again, like engage critically with the music. And by and 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 to that end, I, I feel that a lot of times, and I see this at you know some very 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 large kind of like you know classical platforms where there'll be a piece of music, and the default is just to kind of fawn over you know the composer, the memory of the composer, the legacy of the composer, to you know put the artist to interpret that work on some kind of pedestal, and there is you know this uh, this unwillingness to I guess kind of deconstruct that. To think about uh, to think about what that means to spend more than 150 or 200 words uh, on someone's thoughts about a particular piece, and those thoughts can be very complex and they can be very nuanced. And you know, I'd like to think that, like you know, in this short time that I've been in this world, you know, about you know five years or so, um, I've been able to kind of like chip away, if it is, if, and that's the phrase, um, to kind of you know unlock the potential of some of that conversation to kind of go beyond that. And you know, there's a there is a very there's a very long way to go. Um, but I'm at least, you know, for, for myself, I'm grateful that I can at least spend, you know, more than two, three hundred words on what I think about a particular, you know, uh, person or figure historical or uh, in the present. So mm. that's my piece on that. Yeah. 
Terrence, you know, you've been doing these projects for years that are so, it's, it's funny, you know, we do this work and then it starts to seem every day to us, but when we start doing it, it's really groundbreaking. And I think that a lot of the work that you've done has been groundbreaking and groundbreaking is never easy. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, how you first started making these big, big projects and documentaries and sort of enlarging on, on ideas? Yeah, I was, um, I guess, very fortunate in that when I got into radio, uh, they were looking for performance today. That was my um, foray into radio. And they were looking for someone, a musician who loved radio. And I happened to love that particular show. But I, I just, as I started listening to more public radio, I just felt like there were voices that were missing. And that voice was similar to mine. And so when I got in, they were sort of looking for a voice like mine. So the first documentary I did was on Duke Ellington. And so I came in, um, and this was at Georgia Public Broadcasting where I started uh, before I came on to performance today. And so I came in, uh, you know, in a way like Langston Hughes, he said, I want to write about the people I know, the people I grew up around. So I started, I came in writing about the people that I knew, the people I was interested in, like Ellington. And then when I got to New York Public Radio, I did Martin Luther King first. And then, um, you know, I dipped back into some old um, um, scores that, that William Grant's still Grant, uh, daughter had sent me. And I found Florence Price. So I said, I want to talk about her. Then I was reading about Adam Clayton Powell. And I said, oh my God, his wife Hazel Scott was the bomb. So I'm going to write about her. And I live in Harlem. And, you know, I wanted to, to be able to get off at 125th Street and have those uh, old ladies up in Harlem say, son, we like the work you're doing. <laughs> you like the work you're doing because I wasn't around my grandmother anymore who would have said that to me so being able to resonate in my community was important for me um, and so I tried to create document documentaries that that spoke to the heart of my community and I felt like if they spoke to my heart and to the folks to the hearts of those folks maybe they would extend to all of our listeners you know uh, Andre Watts once said to me he was like you know, he was talking about repertoire. He said, don't get out there and play something that you don't believe in, because if you don't believe in it, you can't convince the audience of it. So I always wanted to write about things that I believed in um, as a way of trying to uh, convince the audience of that perspective. And uh, I've been able to do that uh, year after year after year at WQXR. And, um, you know, it hasn't always been easy, you know, but it's, um, you know, I, I feel like it's been worth the struggle and um, it's been very gratifying to, to be able to do that and have people um, enjoy the work. I'm not sure if I answered no one your ever question, Lara. I just, just went off on a tangent. Yeah, no, I mean, that's the thing. No one ever said it was going to be easy and <laughs> it's not. And we keep pushing forward. And, you know, every, the thing about the kind of content that you've created. I wish I could, I wish we could use a different word. Can we use a different word than content? Um, <laughs> the, the work that you've created, you know, it lives. And every year, you know, I see your MLK documentary circling back around and it's really important too to think about the longevity here and how that impacts the future. Yeah, so Gary, and, let me ask you that, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. And over the, the next few weeks, James and I are gonna be working hand in hand. Um, I'm doing a, a piece on Margaret Bonds coming up. I'm going to do a piece on, on George Walker coming up. I'm doing a piece on Nathaniel Deck coming up and James is going to do the, the uh, digital component to that. So we're going to be working uh, hand in hand and making sure that we're reaching as many people as we can on the digital space and uh, through the radio talking about the same issue and really, you know, I think just broadening the, the perspective of our listeners mm -hmm. and enriching their lives through these new stories. I mean, I think, you know, James is right about not telling that story about the Fifth Symphony for the 18th time this year because our listeners may be tired of that too. So they wanna hear something new. And uh, so I think we're, we're, we're fortunate uh, to be able to tell those stories and have some great stories to tell. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Garrett, you are, um creating a lot of content and you're doing it independently. And I wanted to talk with you a bit about, you know, what that means and sort of what your eye to the future is. Um, there are, you know, 
challenges and benefits to working as an independent. And that has to do with ownership and also sort of, you know, your own direction of your work. Talk a bit about that and um, and how, how that pertains to other people who are watching who are thinking about starting their own platforms or, you know, getting started already. Sure. First, I want to thank James for inspiring the title of the next opus of Triloquy. James said, I like my job and I want to keep my job. We're going <laughs> to we're going to we're going to unpack that on the next opus of Triloquy, because I think there's some very important implications to explore there. Um, so speaking about change, my my biggest change after leaving the stage in an, in an official capacity was a shift in values. Issa Rae once famously said, I'm rooting for everybody black. And that's my mantra. I can't and I won't do anything that I don't think can positively impact black people. BIPOC and diversity initiatives disproportionately serve non-black people of color. And I'm dedicated to addressing that through my work wherever I see it. As far as challenges, you know, a, a, an example that I wanted to bring to the front. So as listeners to uh, my show know, my number two is white. So huge shout out to Scott Blankenship. The deeper we get into our work, the more dissonance we're forced to reconcile behind the scenes because there are certain things that a black gay millennial musician will not have in common with a middle-aged white man with 30 years experience upholding the structures we're trying to demolish. I'm also constantly dealing with critiques when it comes to his presence on my platform. So the way I traverse those challenges is by holding myself accountable. It's my responsibility to make sure that I'm always centering blackness so that I can maintain that trust with my audience and so that my incredible team and the institutions with whom I collaborate understand not only the importance of it, but that I'm not budging and my team is not budging, serving as an example in that way, because we will do a lot to make sure that um, we maintain certain bits, bits of respect or going back to James's quote, keeping our jobs, when in reality, there are things that we actually really need to be pushing back against even more firmly, despite what it might cost. Gretchen, was there anything that you wanted to share about this idea of, um, yeah, the content, where it lives, where it goes? Yeah, I guess um, when I think about from the top, I mean, we are a youth-centered organization. And for me, um, a, a change that is an internal change for from the top is, you know, there's a tension between we've got a huge audience. We have hundreds of thousands of listeners every week and now viewers on our digital platforms. and who are we prioritizing, right? Is it, is it the listeners, is it our audiences or is it these young people who are um, the engine for our organization and, and, and for the art form? Um, and we, although young people have always been prioritized from the top, you know, how do we operationalize that kind of prioritization? And as, you know, if in fact we're a youth-centered organization we are a learning organization and thinking about who are the people who come into contact with our, our young musicians to be their collaborators, to be their mentors. I'm looking right at you, Lara, because you know we started bringing in a bunch of guest hosts um, who really changed how I, I think young people, um, yeah, how they were seeing what the future could be for themselves in terms of careers, in terms of areas of focus. So that's been a, a really big change for From the Top and a really positive one. Um, and you know, having, having partners in this like you or Alex Lang, who's one of our new co-hosts and creatives, you know, those voices, I keep asking myself who, who is not at the table or who is at the table. And so that's been really important for me as a leader to have those kinds of partners, but also for um, our young people. And I will also say, you know, another change it from the top is really looking at investing in um, who's helping us make decisions from the inside out. So one of the, the best things that's happened this year is that David Norville, um, an oboist uh, based in Boston, and you see, he knows you very well, Garrett, yeah. Um, he's been a, a, a work study uh, employee for us for four years, and he's now an associate producer, and having him make decisions alongside other producers um, in a historically white institution, huge. It's huge. And, you know, Lev Mamuya, one of our, our um, 
employees as well in our admissions team, like making sure that we have people who are representing um, the diversity of the young people who we want to see and hear on radio is, has been critical. I think, you know, we all have different places in different pipelines. And um, I'll just share that I have felt very fortunate recently, you know, I'm involved with several media projects. I have this new show on NPR music called Amplify. And I felt so much support and so much buy-in and so much commitment to expanding the narrative and opening up that table, you know, so that there are just a, a much greater variety of um, voices taking part. I'm also, I guess I'll share here, maybe for the first time publicly, I'm about to take over the evening show for KDFC in San Francisco. And I'm entering into that space because, you know, I feel that I will be part of a system-wide commitment to really, you know, being future forward and making a, a, a concerted effort towards greater inclusion and diversity. And it's, and it's so important. But I know we all have, you know, our different places of influence. And I would love to hear from you how you feel about the balance or the, you know, community within your workspaces and how they are serving this effort. And if there are things that can change and be done better. And let's all keep our jobs. <laughs> I'll, I'll go ahead and start. So what is the vision? for you know my audience now and future audience. So my first vision is growth. I think most folks are always looking for ways to grow their audiences, but beyond that, and for me more importantly, I wanna see my audience putting action behind the things that we're trying to normalize and deconstruct in the arts. When people listen, I, I'll throw out a few examples here. When people listen to my interview with Dr. Molly McCann, for example, incredible pianist who, um, uh, specializes in the work of Fanny Hensel, as she says, and also works in the field of cannabis. I want people to think about how they can normalize cannabis use in classical communities. When people listen to my interview with Wayne Shorter, I want them to understand that musical proficiency is only the beginning when it comes to systems change. We didn't spend much time at all talking about music. Next week, I'm featuring representatives from the Coalition of Public Media for All. I want people to listen to that and understand the importance of institutions making amends with individuals and communities that they've ignored over time or even personally hurt. Making this happen requires consistency on my part. I think that's something that we haven't really spoken to yet, consistency. It's a full-time job <laughs> keeping uh, Triloquy afloat, trust me. Some weeks I'm really in it. There are some weeks that I wish I could take a break, but having personally dealt with the violence that is anti-blackness in classical broadcast media, I understand that we have to push forward. I'm thinking about the Negro National Anthem right now. Facing the rising sun until the day is done, let us march on till victory is won. Victory is not yet won, so I'm marching on. To those um, folks in San Francisco who's gonna hear Lara um, during my time slot, you should know that I'm gonna be broadcasting her record, so I'm not sure if she'll be have she'll have that uh, same capability. So if you want to hear her as the pianist, tune in to me on WQXR. In fact, I'll go ahead and, and, and promote this right now, um, that Lara has recorded some music by Florence, by Margaret Bonds that I didn't know existed. It's a piece called perhaps Tang American. Lara, is that it? Yeah. I didn't know that existed. So, so thank you for that. And to, a, to another point, I think by musicians um, taking on this music that isn't Beethoven number five, by addressing uh, composers who have been overlooked and, and reporting their stuff, gives us an opportunity to um, talk about it online, gives us an opportunity to, to play it on air. These opportunities didn't exist when I started in radio uh, almost 20 years ago. And uh, we've tried to create some space for that. Uh, the work Garrett is doing, you know, I think these conversations are, are so important. Um, so there's, you know, I remember this feeling I got when I, when I went to Morehouse and it was a feeling of that there's enough for everybody. Everybody can get a little slice of the pie 
you know, you can you can work to your strengths. I can work to my strengths over here. James can work to his strengths over there. And if we're all pulling together, that that just makes it better for everybody, it, for everyone. And it brings more understanding and perhaps more compassion and more empathy. And, you know, we're all talking about music and music, again, to a point I made earlier, it's about bringing people together. It's about making the world better, about uplifting folks. And I think that we don't all have to do the same thing in the same way, but as long as, as you know, love and equality is at the center, you know, and this thing Garrett is talking about, um, sustained effort. I was thinking about MLK and that Montgomery boy, but in that Montgomery bus boycott, it was over 300 days. They were out there just doing it day after day after day after day, and um, and I and I just applaud you all. I know from the top. It was a show I listened to right alongside performance today. And I thought there were some innovative things happening on From the Top. It was fresh. And I'm looking forward to hearing what Gretchen does with that show and how she expands that show and makes it more inclusive. And I think there's so much potential there. So I just want to, you know, applaud all of you uh, for the work that you're doing. Thank you for saying that. Thank you for saying that really beautifully. And I want to speak to that for a moment because I think that our world is very small. Our world is a tiny little world inside another tiny little world. And I think it's so important for us to see ourselves as a community. And you're right, we all have the things that we can do. And we have to take accountability for those things. We have to take responsibility for those things. You know, I had, I spoke for the um, PRPD, the Public Radio Program Directors meeting some months ago. And I was talking about diversity and programming. And how, you know, diversity in programming is not a question of checking boxes. It's a question of really reconsidering who the audience is, the music that we're playing, the stories we're telling, just, you know, being broad and being truly inclusive. And we had this beautiful conversation. And the thing that kept coming back to me was exactly what you just pointed out. We can't shift the balance truly, fairly, because we don't have the recordings. And we, you know, we all know that. We, how many recordings, I can't do math, but how many recordings of Beethoven's fifth, if there's you know 18 a year. So what can I do about that? I can complain or I can go make the recordings, right? <laughs> you know, So I think we really just have to take action in our own spheres. And um, I don't know if you know Terrence, but Tango American was just a preview of this thing called Rising Sun Music, which is launching next week, which will be sending four new tracks every single month to every single radio station around the country and the world, and hopefully really infusing everybody's libraries with new music, new names, new stories, um, you know, and, and spreading that out. But I, I, I just really, really appreciate everything that you just said. Thank you. Let's talk about the future. We also have a bunch of questions uh, piling up in the chat and I want to leave time for them, but can we dream a little bit about the future of our communities and our audiences and each of us just sort of give a give our vision of what that can look like if we are consistent about our work and we all keep working together. Gretchen, why don't you start with that one? Well, I, you know, this gets to a question actually that that popped up in the chat. How would you describe your audiences? Are there particular groups of people you're trying to influence? As a college music student, this person feels involved, but can't help but feel some top of the ladder people aren't listening to change nearly enough. Um, and I, I will say, um, it, it, this, this brings me to um, the, the fact that we're part of a system, we're part of lots of systems. For from the top, we're part of an educational system. Um, and when a young person auditions for from the top, they bring the piece that they believe they're shining on the most. Um, but we rarely hear new music or music that's composed by BIPOC composers. Um, and we're part of that system, right? So what can from the top do to influence what they're bringing to the auditions to begin with, for example? And then when you think about um, audiences right now, who, who we reach on the radio through our NPR um, system of stations is a, is a very white audience. They're older, they're, um, you know, highly educated white audiences. And one of the things that we need to think about as it relates to any of the, the programs that we're creating, right, are all of these 
offshoots of media that we can be developing where we have more independence. Um, and, but understanding that we, by creating, for example, digital concerts or, you know, during the pandemic from the top started putting out these very short videos called Daily Joy. We've done one every day since mid-March of last year. And they're all produced by young musicians. Um, that has been a hugely, you know, um, healing effort actually on the part of From the Top and this like groundswell coming from a groundswell of um, youth and, I have a lot of questions around, you know, we can, we can, and Garrett, you brought this up at one point in a conversation, we can innovate differently and on different platforms and in different spaces, but we still need to pull and push our audiences um, that are, are not looking the way we want them to look. They're not as youthful, they're not as diverse, and perhaps they're not as accepting of um, audio content that, where, where storytelling, kind of the mix of storytelling and music is viewed as an art form unto itself. You know, we become a society that's very much programming simply music. And um, I'm really interested in helping to create a more curious audience um, that sees art in the, in the holistic storytelling um, kind of combined with music, going back in a sense to that mixed format that I was talking about that I grew up with. Oh, you're muted, Laura. And I was saying something so brilliant. Um, this is a question that we're facing in all the facets of the arts, you know, on the concert stage, over the air, in the digital space, how do we hold on to the audience we know we have and also cultivate a new audience. And I think that the answer is probably by doing that in slightly different spaces, time slots, um, languages, right? It's, it's not trying to accomplish everything at once, but it's the only way forward. And I, I mean, it's, it's kind of staggering to me to see the kind of change that you've made it from the top in, in a short time. And that, that mission, that vision is really strong. Um, Terrence. I have a soft spot for older people, you know, some of my mentors, you know, TJ Anderson is one of my mentors and he's a good friend and he always tells me, oh, you know, we need you there. We need you at that station. We need to keep doing that work. Just keep going. You know, Sanford Howland, you know, the first violinist, uh, black violinist in Philharmonic. I talked to Sanford and he'll say, man, you know, I, I heard that show you did. You just keep going. You know, we need you there. And, um, Elaine Jones, and they, I could go down a list in, of these people who are in their 80s or 90s who went through a lot and who were visible to a lot of young people who uh, were inspired uh, to go into music. I remember being in Georgia and this woman coming to our station to volunteer because she said, my daughter listens to Terrence McKnight on the air and she thinks that his voice sounds like her uncle and she hears him playing those um, all state bands and all state orchestras and now she wants to play violin and so that young girl who was in sixth in the fifth grade at that time ended up being in her you know junior high school orchestra and so that made me think wow you know someone's listening someone's out there there's that little black girl out there who needs to hear my voice in the evening um just like i saw watts that day when i walked in symphony hall that made me think there was space in this world for me so Sometimes, you know, I don't do it so much on QXR, but when I worked on NYC, I would say to my listeners, you know, who I knew were a little bit older and who may not be as tech savvy, I would say to them, oh, you know, get your grandchild to uh, show you how to get online so you can communicate with me. Get your, 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 uh, uh, your, your son or your daughter or your grandson or your granddaughter to help you get online. And so it was a way, I don't know if it worked at all, but it was a way of me trying to build uh, some cross-generational interest um, in, in the work that I was doing. I didn't want to lose those folks and turn those folks off because a lot of those folks have been supporting that station for a long time. But I wanted to also not be true to myself, you know, and, and being true to myself is that person who does uh, value uh, the folks who came before me. And I don't want to, you know, push them aside 
at all. You know, I just want to I just want to bring more people into the fold. And if I can do that by being true to myself, that's that's the best me that I can be. I also want to say something about the assumptions, the assumptions that we make and the expectations that we have. And, you know, we're always talking about the older audience and the younger audience. And I think we do have that kind of codified. And I will tell you my favorite story of my own stupidity that ever happened. I, years ago, I was doing this project uh, based on the Goldberg variations, new, inter new like imaginings of the Goldberg variations. And I got this last minute call to go to this Bach festival up in Oregon. And I literally, you know, flew in the morning and played in the afternoon. They were supposed to have a performance of the Goldberg variations and the pianist had taken ill. And so I was subbing in to do this like 21st century version of the Goldberg variations, huge cathedral, this whole like Bach fanatic audience sitting there. You know, I think they'd gotten a phone call but they didn't even have a new program. Everything was last minute. So I'm sitting there playing through this set of pieces and they, it was a really wide range from very appealing sort of Bach inspired stuff to some pretty spiky, you know, challenging movements. And there was this lady sitting in the front row, this older lady. And she just had one of those faces that you can't read. And then I became obsessed with her and I kept making eye contact every time I would get up from the piano to introduce the next piece. And the whole time I'm thinking, she is hating this so much. And every time I would head into one of the more atonal movements, I would just like think about this lady and how much she was hating it and wishing I was playing the Goldberg Ration. So afterwards we have this Q and A. And I said, you know, I know this wasn't what you were expecting. I know this music is all over the place. You're going to like some things more than others. I would love your feedback about what you enjoyed today. And this lady in the front row raises her hand. And she says, you know, I really enjoyed some of the more atonal variations. <laughs> and I realized so many things. A, don't ever like try to, you know, mind read anyone in the audience. B, if you're a person who's in your 70s or your 80s today, you didn't grow up in the 19th century like you grew up you know in the 60s and the 70s and you could be a very adventurous person and I I just carry that lady with me all the time because when we're talking about inclusion and diversity and community and audience we really have to be broad and we have to think about everyone and not second guess them and give them the opportunity for discovery and I think that's what we're talking about we're talking about giving the opportunity for discovery all the time. With all of that being said, I still think we have to look at the material. As I began my part of the conversation saying, you know, I'm looking at not including certain aesthetics, but really centering them because they've never been centered before. So while I don't want to leave anyone behind, I think we're still, um, at least large institutions are still centering you know, that traditional audience. I went over to the WQXR website just now and we're listening to the Met Opera perform Faust. That doesn't speak to me. How can that even, how can, so how could that possibly speak to someone without the classical training? I think it's very important to not leave people behind, but we can't pretend as if we aren't continuing to center those audiences instead of moving forward and turning the corner so that all of this stuff can survive. That's James. James is on the digital. That's um, <laughs> terrestrial, man. Yeah. So why, are we, why are we listening to Faust today, James? We're listening to, well, this, no, I mean, all right, yeah, we're listening to Faust today because of an agreement that the station has with Toll House Network and the Metropolitan Opera <laughs> that when they do their afternoon matinee, uh, stations across the country carry that matinee. It's a legacy thing. And that does call into question, what's the efficacy of legacy, Right. When do you when do you when do you break it off? Should you break it off? Do you have to? That, that's a that that's that's the question of I guess you know um, it's it's a conservative thing, right? Holding on to that tradition because it's the way it's always been, you know. In, in these conversations about like our, our vision for the audience and like the future, for me, like I've been I've begun to think of music as a uh, as a spectrum. Right, it's, I, I really don't like necessarily the idea of like genre. And I know I'm not the only one to think that. That's not a groundbreaking thing. Um, but the thing about classical music that's very interesting to me is like this need for the music itself to be so prescriptive in a way. And I think that in a place like the United States of America, this, you know, continental massive physical space that's made up of different cultures and, and nations and identities, Nothing can really exist, even artistically, in its own vacuum. I don't think anything can just be classical music. That classical music has to interact and share space with the blues and, 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 and jazz and folk traditions from you know, the Southwest to Appalachia, right? Um, 
you know, I was, I've been reading a lot, I'm working on a separate project, but I've been reading a lot of like Ralph Ellison's uh, um, nonfiction, like criticism. And he wrote this essay in 1955 and he kind of gets at this and he's talking about, you know, when he's a, when he's a kid in Oklahoma uh, and the teacher, the music teacher puts on Carnival of the Animals, right? Same song. And listening to the swan and the teacher's like, can you hear it? Can you hear the swan in the music? It's the swan. And all the kids are like, we're not hearing the swan, but we're going to nod along and say we hear it. And he had one friend who was like, I hear a green snake. I don't hear, I don't hear the swan you're talking about. And they kept getting into a fight with the teacher. And then he closes out by saying, you know, we need to be able to listen to this music. He's, he's like, you can live with music or you can die with sound. And so you have to be able to live with that music and recognize in America, right? It is not uh, a question of, you know, musical supremacy. He says that, you know, it's not a big leap to go from, you know, the, 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 uh, the spiritual aspects, right, of that African-American folk music and that Black folk tradition to the symphonies of Bach or the, you know, Beethoven or the Beethoven or the um, symphonies of Beethoven and the Bach chorales. And he's like, the, the way we romanticize, right? We have this romantic vision of, you know, people like Liszt and Chopin, but he's like, you know, you can connect that easily to the romance of, you know, Louis Armstrong's trumpet. And I, I just find a need for this kind of music to be put into equal footing, into dialogue with the other traditions that exist in, um, in America. And I, and I wanna be able to have those audiences be able to have that conversation, listening to music spectrally Right, instead of in these, you know, little notes, nodularly, I guess is the word. Um, so that's what I would love to. Well, help me understand. Well, then help me understand the use of that conversation and everything you've said. If you're beholden to the legacy Saturday Opera again, at the end of the day, there's Faust on the radio. Nothing that speaks specifically to Black communities. Well, I mean, in that case, you might have a point. Then I'm have to see that point that maybe that isn't serving anybody. Maybe that isn't serving an interest. You know, I don't have like, go ahead. And this is a bigger question too. This is about, you know, financial support and where that is found. And I think part of the job here is to redefine our community of supporters too, so that there aren't these really, you know, rigid streams of support. And we are having a, a wider group of, of stakeholders who can be part of the conversation about what we need to hear and why and when. Yeah, and if I could just like hop in real quick, I was talking to um, uh, Anthony Davis, you know, um, the composer about, I mean, this is right after after the election actually. So I was working on a, a piece about how classical music can, what, what it's going to look like, what it could look like, you know, after the bad guy is out of office, you know, quote unquote. Um, but, you know, he was, he told me, he was like this idea, and this again, it's, it, this is the question. He said that the idea that, you know, you're necessarily beholden to the idea of, you know, the, the audience and pleasing them and doing what they want to do. He's like, audience participation, he's like, that's not what keeps institutions afloat. He said, he, he said it's like this idea that, oh, we're doing this because this is what people want to listen to. This is what's giving us money. Thanks to them, we're able to kind of stay alive. And, um, you know, he said it to me and I, 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 I sat with this and I've been thinking about that. But I just wanted to kind of, you know, throw that to the to the group. But maybe that's the case that we're kind of, you know, institutionally, right? We're shunting off some responsibility of change by deferring to this idea. It's like that's what the audience wants. This is what we have to do. And to quote you, I like my job and I want to keep my job. Also true. <laughs> I mean, it's it's a it's 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 such a frustrating pickle. You know, what is one allowed to, how far can you go before you piss somebody off? What's the line between exploring that topic the way you want to do it versus how it fits the editorial or on-air ethos, right, of where you are? And it's- Okay, but right now I'm asking us to dream, which is fun. <laughs> <laughs> so I will answer my own question and I will say that my dream of the future audience is an audience made up of kids who have grown up who were never forced to hear the swan who were asked instead, what do you hear? And who were able to come up with their own vision and their own response to the music, who then grow to love the music because they hear us tell stories about this music that includes them all the time. That that continuum that we're talking about that respects and honors all music, musical traditions becomes the norm so that we are not 
paying reverence to a few historical figures because that's the way it's always been, but we are opening our ears and our hearts and our minds and we're just letting everything be together. And those kids grow up and they fill the concert halls and they support us as artists and we support them. And I think that happens, you know, by us continuing to do this hard work, by Gretchen, you know, assisting the next generation of artists to come into fruition. By us just, you know, believing again, that change is slow and change is necessary and change happens one step at a time. Anyway, I'll, 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 ins I'll invite people to recall a quote um, from James Baldwin and I won't get it exactly right, but you know, how, who, how, whose time? I'm sure Terrence knows what I'm talking about. All of my grandmother's time, a lot of my mom's time. She's in her 60s right now. I don't want you to take all my time. I, I want to see it. So, you know, in, in the same, I will agree that it is one step at a time. And there are certain things that unfortunately have to be incremental. I see my position as pushing, 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 pushing as hard as I can, because I think incremental change and in one step at a time is how we're how we're still listening to Faust on Saturday afternoon. My dream. Garrett. Yeah, please. My dream is. Um, I used to travel with this reggae band. Called Morgan Heritage and we travel in the Caribbean and we went to these and they would do these huge festivals and people would come out all kinds of folks and people would just have a good time listening to music they it didn't race didn't seem to matter age didn't seem to matter uh maybe uh, you know it, it just it was just a beautiful scene that was it seemed to be infused with love and i think in my dream world that classical music concerts can be like that if we if we prescribe them the right way. If we mix it up and have everybody's culture represented on that stage, and you have all kinds of improvisatory music and you go from, from style to style, genre to genre, culture to culture on an equal, you know, with equality. And you create this environment on stage that's about inclusivity. I think it filters out into that audience and we are able to hear each other and see each other with the same kind of beauty that we see ourselves. I think that's my dream to be able to create that kind of environment for music. And I, you know, I've done it on radio with, I had a whole series called All Ears where I did that just went from style to style from, you know, monk to, to, you know, just all over the place, connecting music through trying to connect people by connecting their um, cultures through music. And that's sort of my dream, Lara. It's a good one. It's a good one. I want to share with all of you this quote from Langston Hughes that has been my go-to this year, my salvation this year, maybe. And you can substitute the word artist with storyteller, with mm, presence, person. Perhaps the mission of an artist is to interpret beauty to people, the beauty within themselves. And I think that's what we can do. You know, we can help reflect everyone. We can invite everyone in and um, interpret the beauty. I want to thank all of you for spending your time and sharing your perspectives. And this is such a long conversation. I know that we are all reachable and I think we didn't get to many of your questions and I hope that you will reach out to us individually and, and keep this conversation going. I know there's a lot of work going on in the world along these lines, and I'm grateful for all of it. Thank Laura, you. I just have to jump in and say what great teachers this group is. I'm looking around the screen. So grateful for all of you. Thank you for this mm -hmm. conversation. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for being there. Keep up the advocacy, you guys. <laughs>